Hi everyone, it's uh, two o'clock now, so we're just ready to get started with our SolSmart Solar Plus Storage, a guide for local governments webinar. Uh, we appreciate everybody uh, joining and taking the time out of, uh, out of uh, your schedule and these harrowing times to listen to uh, some information about pairing solar and storage and uh, how you can move forward with that for local governments. Uh, so we've got uh, four panelists essentially, myself, and uh, three other of my colleagues that we'll introduce shortly. Um, and we're excited to talk with you guys about solar and storage. So we'll get right into it with, uh, I'm going to present a little bit of an intro so everyone has a sense of what SolSmart's about and why this webinar connects with SolSmart. Um, and we can go from there. So a little bit of information about SolSmart. Uh, we're funded for, from the U.S. Department of Energy's Solar Energy Technologies Office. Uh, we have the goal of helping local governments make it easier, faster, more affordable to go solar. Um, so essentially what we do is we help out communities with their solar-related goals. Uh, our program uh, is open to U.S. municipalities, so uh, cities, villages, towns, uh, any level that's interested as well as counties and regional organizations that are looking at uh, getting rid of some of the soft costs of solar um, in their communities. Uh, how we do that is we provide a designation uh, when certain criteria are reached through the SolSmart program. Um, we have three different levels of designation, which are SolSmart Gold, Silver, and Bronze. Uh, there are different criteria you can reach to get designated at these levels. and uh, we, we also, in order to help these communities reach those designations, we provide technical assistance um, on different uh, areas of uh, solar soft cost reduction, um, which I'll go into a little bit. Um, these are just a couple of our um, technical assistance program providers and designation program administrators um, that work with the SolSmart program uh, several of which, uh, the other three of which outside of the Solar Foundation, which I work at, um, are going to be on this call and presenting um, different sections. So you'll get to hear from a few individuals on those teams. Uh, we have several SolSmart categories, um, which we use to provide uh, points for our criteria. So these are just a couple of the categories that we pro provide assistance on. So things permitting, planning and zoning, inspection, construction codes, um, community engagement, all kinds of different categories that we provide assistance in, and we try to lower the soft costs. In. And this is just a short acknowledgement disclaimer. Um, we are supported by the DOE and the U.S. government, but um, uh, under, under an award, but we uh, prepared this, and it's sponsored by the U.S. government, but the U.S. government um, nor any of its agencies make any legal liability or responsibility claims, and also um, the opinions within this presentation are not necessarily the opinions of the U.S. government or any of its agencies. So just a short uh, legal jargon there. Um, with, that, with that in mind, I'll turn it over to uh, one of our panelists, which is Nadavan Barr. He's uh, from the Electric Power Research Institute, and he'll get us started. Great, thanks a lot, Danny. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right, fantastic. Good uh, good afternoon or, or morning, everybody, depending on where you are. Excited to be here today, and thanks for joining. Really, as the, speak, the first speaker up, I'm gonna take the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes or so to, to portray a bit of an overview of the PV plus storage market and its core drivers, and then I wanna shift to look a little bit at uh, a fundamental challenge hindering the adoption of solar plus storage adoption you know and that's that's really permitting so if you can advance to the next slide dan okay great so here's what i'm going to cover at a fairly fast clip uh talk a little bit again about market developments of uh, standalone pv standalone storage but uh really with an emphasis on the two technologies paired together uh talk about permitting in terms of its definition and its major barriers and, and then provide a little bit of a preamble in terms of the advancements uh, in the area of permitting that um, communities and local governments can consider emulating uh, as they um, pursue um, some some activities that can uh, that can improve 
uh, the permitting process. But you know, my, my main takeaway message here is really that solar and storage systems are coming. And right now there are a number of things in flux. And in some cases, you know, technical uh, and economic or market innovations are happening faster than the development of rules and regulations to help implement them. You know, things are variable depending on the state that, uh, that uh, permitting is occurring, uh, requirements enforced by local governments, the types and the sizes of systems, uh, but this is an area that communities and local governments can address by developing guidelines, uh, messaging, and, and the processes that provide direction and clarity to developers of PV plus storage systems on how to deploy uh, these technologies uh, safely and reliably. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, what I'd like to start with is just a, a quick uh, snapshot of of the market. Um, this, this is a, a little bit of an involved slide, but um, you know what you're seeing here uh, is uh, an indication on the left of uh, the trajectory of distributed PV installations uh, really over the last 10 years and projected outward to 2024. Um, I should mention here that the growth is measured on a capacity basis, and so that's really about you know, um, how much the maximum output of all of the systems that have been accounted for uh, combined, what that, what that amounts to. And, and really the basic takeaway here is if you look at the green line, uh, combined installations of residential PV and commercial PV, uh, they're really uh, increasing quite a bit, uh, hockey stick-like trajectory. I couldn't really dig up a graph that depicts the number of PV systems themselves that have been deployed. Uh, in this time period, uh, but as an aside, I can share that about the milestone of 2 million installations, PV installations, was reached in the United States in early 2019, and that occurred just three years after the industry completed its 1 millionth installation, which itself took 40 years to achieve. So a little anecdote about the accelerating nature by which PV is, is actually uh, being installed. On the right, you can see uh, behind the meter customer cited energy storage installations in the US and it's following a similar trajectory. But of course, you know, energy storage is really in its commercial infancy. So deployments are small, but again, they're poised to significantly ramp up. What we want to focus on here today really are the blue and red bars, the residential and non-residential or commercial industrial bars that are showing a steady upward trajectory uh, akin to uh, historically what we've seen in the PV area. I should just quickly note before moving on uh, that these numbers and, and those in successive slides, this is pre-COVID, so that will have a dampening effect on some of the near-term market outlook, but it's not expected to really alter the long-term expectations for both of these uh, technologies. Next slide. I did manage to find some data on energy storage system deployments in the US. Uh, these are for uh, installations for households and businesses. They're smaller battery systems, and nearly all of them are composed of a lithium ion chemistry. Um, so it depicts quarterly installs from 2013 to 2019. And again, the numbers are small, but uh, the trend is that they're ramping up. Uh, about 22,000, 23,000 systems were deployed in, in all during 2019, and that's about a 50% increase uh, over 2018. That growth is really expected to continue into the future. And if you go to the next slide, um, I wanted to quickly spotlight the emerging solar plus storage market, right? So we saw some of the standalone stuff, but let's look at these two technologies paired to together. And these two graphs really convey the same message, really, but they illustrate it in different ways. PV plus storage is anticipated to become a growing part of the overall solar market for homeowners and businesses. So on the left, you can see uh, behind the meter solar paired with storage systems on an, a yearly basis, and it shows it in capacity terms as well as a percentage of the PV market. And you know, just a brief highlight again, PV plus storage is expected to comprise when this data was, was taken about 300 megawatts in 2019. 
and rise to over 1,500 in 2023. So really of the total solar market uh, for residential and commercial systems in 2019, that's less than 5%. And looking uh, out to the future, 2023, uh, we're exceeding 25%. Uh, at right, it's a similar uh, snapshot, just not seen longitudinally, of just looking at the overarching distributed solar system or distributed solar market and how much of that market uh, becomes uh, solar plus storage uh, over the next uh, five or so years. Again, uh, in, in five years, the projection here is 25% of the market, the solar market for residential and commercial house uh, businesses will comprise solar plus storage systems. Next slide. So what's driving the market uptake of standalone PV, standalone storage, and, and PV plus storage? And, and really at a high level, it's, it's the economics. It's growing recognition by consumers about the benefits of adopting PV plus storage. And it's also a growing degree of consumer comfort. As we'll see in a minute, costs are falling for the systems themselves and you know, the price points themselves are coming down, uh, but there's also available incentives and financing that's sweetening the economic outlook. So there's the federal investment tax credit, uh, which is uh, still in play. Uh, there are statewide incentives such as California's self-generation incentive program, which provides rebates uh, to qualifying uh, systems like PV and storage. Uh, there are a number of other uh, statewide energy mandates, clean energy mandates that are also helping to develop programming uh, that is uh, reducing costs uh, for, these, for these systems. But there's also emerging opportunities for system owners to earn revenues by providing grid services to wholesale markets through their, their systems. So that's kind of sweetening the pot a little bit. And as we're seeing a bit of a transition away from traditional compensation mechanisms like net energy metering and those now kind of evolving to time of use rates right where different uh, times of the day equate to different prices for electricity um, more cu solar customers are starting to be encouraged to self-consume their pv generation during different times of the day using a battery uh, to reduce their bills uh, quickly uh, public safety power shutoffs, which have been occurring in California due to fire risks, are also pushing the desire for backup power. And in this blue box here, uh, that's really the principal reason why there's been such an incredible increase in what we're calling PV attachment rates or uh, PV systems that are being paired with, with storage, uh, both in, uh, in California primarily, but you can also see the uptake in, uh, nationally in the United States. Incidentally, Hawaii is not uh, fire related. It has more to do with uh, the, the successor policies to net energy metering uh, in that state. Uh, there's also business model innovation that I'll briefly talk on and uh, growing consumer familiarity. So let's, let's talk about these in a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. Again, very briefly, uh, the prices for PV and, and batteries and storage uh, are coming down. On the left is the trajectory of average PV system prices um, shown for residential up top, commercial in the middle, and then a much larger scale systems at the bottom. And, and really, I don't wanna spend a lot of time here. A lot of folks know this already, uh, but I think it's just instructive to be able to see the downward trend in these PV system prices. Uh, and it's pronounced uh, much more readily in the chart beneath the, the, the uh, excuse me, the table beneath the chart uh, when you look at 2007 uh, price points and what they're projected to be in 2022. Um, you know, essentially we're seeing reduced payback times uh, due to um, lowering price points, uh, which are becoming more palatable for consumers. And it's a similar uh, a picture if we look to the right, which shows the installed system prices for uh, smaller battery systems, again, for residential, and commercial systems. This is really a canvassing of the industry uh, to really through survey to see what price points are out there. Um, but quarter over quarter, uh, behind the meter system prices are falling. They have been flat of late because of battery supply constraints and, and product availability. Uh, but those uh, situations are improving. 
Uh, and it's uh, now becoming clear that soft costs, like those that are um, relevant to permitting, which we'll talk about in a minute, are becoming a larger chunk of the the price that is uh, a price component that makes up the overall system price of batteries uh, of PV and, and PV plus storage. Next slide. Okay, so this slide uh, depicts the various ways in which solar and storage can benefit the customer, as well as various components of the electrical system. Uh, the storage component of a PV plus storage system, it can provide what's known as a value stack of services that provide revenue generating and revenue saving opportunities uh, for the customer or the asset owner. Now, for the purpose of time, I I'm not gonna focus too much on uh, a number of the system benefits uh, pres you know, that are alluded to in this slide. Uh, instead, I really want to just quickly focus on some of the customer benefits from solar plus storage. And, and you know, chief among them is, is bill savings, right? By, by really by reducing the amount of, of uh, electricity that's purchased from the grid um, during more expensive times of day or, or during peak times of the day, and instead uh, using the generation that is stored in your battery and pr provided through solar, you're able to reduce your, your energy bill, right? And this can be particularly pronounced if you happen to live or operate in an area that has a time of use tariff, which I briefly uh, discussed. Um, this is also a way for, uh, I should say, PV plus storage is also a way for commercial businesses, for example, uh, to reduce their demand charges, which are a fairly large uh, portion of the electricity uh, bill. Uh, there are also ways to uh, be able to harness um, the uh, solar plus storage systems for emergency backup uh, to avoid uh, any type of disruption from grid outages. Uh, and there are revenue uh, generating uh, possibilities by providing grid services uh, through uh, an energy storage uh, uh, plus PV system, uh, often that can be undertaken through utility programs. Next slide. Another driver, as I alluded to earlier, is, is public safety power shutoff uh, events or PSPS events. And, and really, uh, this is really about uh, events in which there is a de-energization of power lines in order to blunt uh, the possibility of, of fires, right? Uh, PSPS events have really risen sharply in recent years, particularly in California, and they have the potential to spread to other jurisdictions outside of California really as a means for combating mounting weather or climate related challenges. Challenges. So battery backup systems have become an a little bit more attractive because they offer the ability for consumers to, to mitigate the social and the economic impacts caused by, by these PSPS events. In some cases, uh, battery storage vendors are uh, and anecdotally sharing that demand for their products as, as an add-on to solar systems, uh, and this is directly related to these outages, has increased from anywhere from 30% to 500%. Next slide. Okay, and, and briefly, there's a lot going on here in this slide. I encourage you to look at it uh, in greater detail uh, if you uh, download the slides later. But there's a lot of business model innovation that's evolving through utility programs and vendor offerings that's making PV and storage more accessible. Uh, you know, two quick highlights, one a vendor, one a utility. Uh, Sunrun, uh, for example, uh, offers an, an aggregation type of product, which which really intends to provide additional revenues by, by pooling the capacity of, of the PV and storage systems it deploys and making it available to the grid operator during times of peak grid electricity demand. So that's a way to maybe increase the value of these, these uh, smaller systems in aggregate. And meanwhile, there's a utility, Green Mountain Power in Vermont, that offers a number of different programs effectively that provide energy storage systems to, to uh, its customers uh, for backup power, but that also allows the utility to access the units uh, for grid services that can reduce uh, grid congestion. So, um, you know, those are just uh, two of uh, a, num a number of uh, programs and innovations that are, uh, that are evolving. Next slide. 
And then really lastly, there's this notion of rising consumer confidence. PV is a fairly well-known quantity right now for many consumers, but storage is still, I'd say, pretty black box. But as with PV before it, there's a growing consumer comfort with the technology uh, as system testing is occurring and certifications and guidelines are beginning to uh, materialize. So this slide just shows um, a number of different systems that are being tested and examined along with their, their price points. And these prices are expected to come down as more products enter the market, uh, competition exu uh, ensues and, and scale economies are realized. So again, greater awareness uh, and interaction uh, with these systems by consumers is, is likely to increase their purchases. Next slide. Okay, so let's let's transition to the permitting piece here and its role as an adoption barrier. And I think Bill, uh, who's going to follow me, is, is really going to uh, help to uh, dig a little bit deeper uh, in, uh, into some of these issues. And, you know, first let's define permitting. As shown here, it's really the process of receiving approval for system installation and interconnection of a uh, distributed energy resource like PV plus storage to the electrical grid. Really, installing PV plus storage system requires electrical and construction work uh, that has to be in compliance with codes and standards to address safety concerns. These codes and standards are really enforced by individual um, uh, governments uh, and authorities uh, with jurisdiction, having jurisdiction uh, that developers must uh, effectively comply with. Um, but, you know, Obtaining these different permits can really vary depending on the location of where uh, you're looking to install a system and the codes that are enforced there um, by the system type and the design of the system, the size of that system. You might need extra permits for a large versus a small system. Uh, there also has to occur inspection before and after installation to make sure that everything's properly installed. Uh, there are, you know, varying costs and approval times, uh, let's say hundreds to thousands of dollars in terms of costs. Some jurisdictions do provide cost caps, which are helpful. Uh, and, and sometimes it can be uh, weeks to months in terms of, uh, of permitting uh, approval times, again, based upon the vagaries of what a jurisdiction is, is enforcing. So a number of these issues uh, need to be addressed and improved upon. Next slide. So, so ultimately, you know, the root of the challenges here is that there's a lot of uncertainty and there's lagging education regarding uh, permitting and, and needs for, for permitting, permitting to uh, achieve uh, safety, uh, really to uh, uphold safety. There's a bit of a, a lagging technical and functional awareness by, by folks who are responsible for, for permitting these storage, uh, solar plus storage systems, uh, which is in turn, um, you know, perhaps having communities uh, focus on uh, codes and compliance with codes that might not need, be necessary or incorporating additional aspects of the permitting process pro that might be a bit redundant. Really the takeaway here is that um, this level of confusion um, has led to delays in permitting, um, increases in costs, and inconsistency in the actual rules and requirement uh, that jurisdictions are enforcing, sometimes uh, these, these counties are right next to each other, uh, which is extremely frustrating for developers and for um, system owners. Next slide. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of things here in my, my uh, waning time. There, there are a number of advancements and ambitions, those things that are being uh, worked on as, as we speak, um, that can be emulated by, uh, by city governments uh, and, and counties and, and other jurisdictions. And, and here I just want to quickly highlight some of them. I mean, uh, to start with, there are jurisdictions that are beginning to educate and provide documentation about the processes needed, set expectations really about uh, the processes uh, and, and times and effort needed to permit and interconnect uh, solar plus storage. Boulder County is, is one such example, which we'll be talking about and referencing in just a moment, uh, that provides a guide uh, and a degree of clarity to developers in as far as the permitting 
of solar plus storage systems. California is also working on a statewide permitting guidebook uh, that it hopes to make available in the coming years. There are a number of uh, developments in the standards and codes arena that are also uh, efforting to provide a greater guidance in terms of the needs and requirements for safe installation of particularly energy storage systems. A few of them are referenced here. Uh, for example, UL 9540 is a, is a testing um, approach uh, that uh, enables certification of, uh, of energy storage. Uh, that's beginning to be used um, uh, as, uh, by several products for certification. Uh, a, a big issue here is the National Fire Protection Association's NFPA 855, which is a standard for the installation of sta stationary energy storage systems. That's providing, again, uh, greater guidance in terms of what needs to be, what we need to be mindful of in terms of uh, uh, installation. Um, what remains is the need to have the standard enforced by jurisdictions in a way that can lead to standardization. Quickly, there's also um, some online permitting innovations that are underfoot. There are some jurisdictional approaches, for example, in San Diego, uh, city and county, that have moved the permitting process uh, initially of PV and uh, in the future potentially to energy storage online, uh, thus being able to streamline and more clearly communicate what is necessary uh, for, uh, for the uh, permitting and interconnection of, of these systems. And the Solar Foundation is in fact also involved in the development of what's known as the Solar Automated Permit Processing or Solar App, uh, which is uh, intended for the solar market uh, to be able to streamline uh, uh, the processing of permits, but also has application to energy storage. Uh, I know I'm uh, running out of time here, so just real quickly, Danny, if you could go to the next slide. I'm not going to spend too much time because I don't want to take away from our uh, our other speakers here, but uh, the NFPA 855 is a is a big deal, and it's really intended to provide again um, a little bit uh, more in the way of of, of direction around uh, siting and protection equipment requirements in order to really standardize um, the way in which energy storage can be installed and uh, the way in which inspectors can understand. Um, the way in which uh, installation should occur. So um, this was actually published in October of 2019, and now there's work uh, to be able to, to have it adopted in a consistent manner across different jurisdictions. Next slide. Uh, briefly, uh, IEEE 1547 is a, is a big deal that has been revised. Uh, this is the standard that oversees the interconnection of distributed energy resources in North America. Uh, and there is a development afoot now to develop a guide, 1547.9, that really gets into the uh, nitty gritty of energy storage interconnection requirements and the rationales governing them. That should also help to increase the speed and the safety with which energy storage and PV plus storage systems uh, can be uh, implemented into the grid. Next slide. And there are also a number of efforts uh, at the state level uh, and city level to uh, provide standardization to permitting. New York City uh, has developed something uh, dating back to 2018. Uh, without getting into too much detail here, uh, it's not perfect, but it is a start that um, uh, we can build upon in terms of lessons learned and, and, and ways forward. And as I mentioned, California is also working on a energy storage permitting guidebook that should go a long way towards uh, helping to standardize the process across the state and perhaps be implemented outside the state by others uh, so interested. So I'd like to finish off on the next slide by just uh, providing some reference materials uh, to interested uh, folks on the phone uh, and uh, welcome you to the Energy Storage Integration Council's webpage, which has a number of useful uh, reference materials uh, that you can download for free if you'd like to learn more about uh, you know, commissioning specific considerations for PV, for storage, and for the two technologies paired together. And with that, uh, I'd like to end and just indicate that I'd uh, love to take questions uh, at the end of uh, our time together after uh, 
the two speakers following me have a chance to present their materials. Thanks, and I now hand it off to you, Bill. Great, thanks, Nadav. Appreciate your talk. Excellent material there, and uh, also a good-looking guy. Let's go to the next slide because uh, we don't look at that too long. But um, energy storage systems. You saw a lot of nice pictures in Nadav's presentation and showed a lot of different applications, many of which were residential in nature. This is a fairly large residential system, and we're talking about energy storage systems, the National Electrical Code, and the uh, building codes have now adopted that term. And uh, we can see this is actually, uh, many people have heard of Tesla. You can see those three battery units in the bottom right, and then there's a, a PV inverter in the front, in, in the center, a uh, little white box, uh, solar edge box. And then on the left, the, that open box happens to be what we call a microgrid interconnect device, MID. Uh, but this is a house system, and it's a very elaborate one, by the way, and, and not inexpensive. Uh, but we're talking about the components that are assembled together that store electrical energy. Um, so let's go to the next slide. We're going to run through these fairly quickly. Um, this slide is just uh, delineating a PV system versus um, other aspects of a system. So in the past, in the 2014 code and before, um, PV systems included the energy storage. Um, and now when we talk about PV plus storage, we're talking about a, uh, a separate system. So we have a PV power source that uh, on a DC coupled system would be supplying DC power into uh, the system, and then there'd be energy storage system that would also be supplying DC power into that system. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is an AC coupled system. I apologize for the uh, fonts there, a little hard to read, but uh, um, it must have a virus or something. So um, anyway, there's uh, um, the PV system in that, that slide we saw a couple slides back. Uh, was showing an interactive inverter, a small white PV inverter, uh, interacting with a large energy storage system to supply power that could supply standalone loads in the event of a power system shut uh, shutdown, like I've actually experienced in my house. Uh, we had a four-day shutdown this past fall uh, at my house, um, and it was really nice to have a battery storage system to get through that four-day shutdown. And so we're gonna see a lot more of those. Uh, of course, these systems also can interact with the utility grid. Let's go to the next slide. All right, and, and Nadav already uh, mentioned some of these things, but the Article 706 is Energy Storage Systems in the National Electrical Code. It was established in 2017 in the code. Uh, I was involved somewhat in the, in the development of that article along with uh, quite a few other folks. And um, we took a lot of the material that was in Article 690, which is PV systems, uh, and some of the information that's in Article 480 on storage batteries and created this new article. Also, the International Fire Code uh, developed uh, a whole new section uh, that took their material from, uh, from Section 608 um, and established a new uh, section on stationary energy storage systems for the 2018 IFC. Uh, interesting to be aware of is that the International Residential Code, the IRC, supersedes the, the fire code for one and two family dwellings. So there are some differences. As we go to the next slide, we'll be uh, talking about some of those. As I mentioned, there's a, the, the 1206 superseded um, 608, and it is primarily because of the need to address lithium ion batteries. Um, everyone has probably seen YouTube videos of, of uh, hoverboards and things like that catching on fire. And, and obviously that creates a, a major concern. Um, we lithium ion batteries don't generally catch on fire. And there's a lot that we've learned about them in the last decade or so about how to treat them properly. And, and uh, these are not consumer products like uh, we've seen advertised uh, or in these YouTube videos. These are listed uh, energy storage systems. And as Nadav mentioned, UL 9540 is now a requirement. All systems that go into buildings, uh, particularly residential, is required to have UL 9540 certification. 
Um, there's also a UL standards for the battery themselves. And all these batteries are required to have energy management systems. Um, uh, and they have to pass the UL standards for inverters and the like, which is the same standard that's used for PV. Let's go to the next slide. A lot has changed in the last 20 years, and uh, you can see a flooded battery like that. We don't really see flooded batteries like that anymore, uh, probably won't in this application. Uh, moving forward, that, that battery would not be able to pass UL 9540, for instance. Um, so uh, the codes and standards are rapidly changing. Lithium ion chemistries definitely are um, uh, provide a, some great service. It's an excellent technology, um, and it raises some new concerns, and that's why the building standards and the co electrical codes and all have been very focused on these issues. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so there's a lot of development in this area, and uh, as I mentioned, 9540 is the new standard, and we'll, we'll see some equipment uh, certified to that standard. Nadav mentioned uh, NFPA 855, um, it's not directly enforced by most jurisdictions. There's a few very large jurisdictions like Manhattan and other places like that that may be adopting NFPA 855. It is more uh, used to um, influence the language in the 2021 residential code and fire code uh, that have a lot of similarities to the wording that went into 855. So let's go to the next, thing, uh, next slide. Um, so the scope of the IFC is stationary energy storage above 20 kilowatt hours. The scope of the IRC is uh, one and two family dwelling systems of uh, up to uh, whatever size would be relevant, uh, listing the 9540. Um, the IFC talks about that 50 kilowatt hour blocks have to be separated by three feet. And they also talk about large scale fire testing, which is, uh, the, the number it looks an awful lot like the, the standard number for energy storage systems is UL 9540A, and that stands for the large scale fire testing, uh, which allows for other options. And so Tesla and other companies have certified their products using large scale fire testing that allows them to put their blocks closer than three feet together. Also, these standards talk about, uh, the codes talk about uh, vehicle impact protection like putting it on the garage sidewall. We already saw several pictures uh, of garage sidewall uh, applications. If you did put it on the, the back wall of a, of a garage, there might need to be a parking block or something like that to prevent the vehicle, uh, if, the vehic if it was at low enough that the vehicle could actually run into it. And then fire suppression is required in the IFC. It is not required in the IRC. And so that's why there's uh, limitations on the size of systems up to 80 kilowatt hours in residences. Next slide. There's gonna be lots and lots of retrofits of PV systems. As Nadav pointed out, we've got over 2 million PV systems. Uh, the vast majority of residential energy storage systems are going into houses that already have PV or it's going in as a package with PV and energy storage. So it's very rare for an energy storage system to go in to a house that doesn't have PV. With commercial, it's, it's, it's a, uh, more of a mix. Um, so it might be 60% of the systems have PV and 40% don't that have energy storage. So those numbers are gonna constantly fluctuate depending on the, on the rate structures and things like that. But this is gonna be a very, very common uh, seen to see PV, uh, the energy storage added to a project like this. This happens to be the eBay facility. Next slide. Uh, residential permitting considerations. Um, so there's some specific wording in the 2018 code that it's installed, must be listed in 9540. And um, so lithium ion is really what you, is, is the only thing currently listed to UL 9540. We'll probably see some sealed uh, lead acid battery storage technologies added to UL 9540 over the next uh, year or two, uh, but right now it's all lithium ion. Next slide. Okay, so here's a list. Uh, this happens to be Intertext list that we're gonna see just to uh, give you an example of these are the products. I pulled this down just last week off of the internet. 
Um, these are a currently available products. You can see Tesla's on there, Solar Edge is on there. Uh, you see uh, a company called Pica Energy, which was purchased by uh, Generac, one of the largest backup power uh, companies in the United States. Um, Blue Planet Energy, DynaPower. These are all uh, companies, uh, Sonin. Uh, these are available off-the-shelf products, and uh, Nadav had some nice examples of those early in his presentation of several different types. Let's go to the next slide. The next slide, so here you go. You see the Tesla system, as we pointed out before. Uh, that solar edge inverter at the top there is not part of the energy storage system. That's, a P, that's part of the PV system. So the energy storage system is those Tesla batteries, and there's three energy storage systems um, next to each other. They happen to be 13 kilowatt energy storage systems. And because of large-scale fire testing, Tesla has evaluated these things to be able to set them closer together than three feet and things like that. So let's go to the next slide and we'll see. Um, here's an example of CSAs. Um, LG Electronics, LG Chem is, um, is one of the biggest suppliers. We saw some examples of that, BYD. I have a BYD uh, battery at my facility, at my house, and I'm getting ready to in install an LG Chem. So those were certified by CSA and Delta Electronics. They were starting to see some of those going in. So just these examples. Let's go to the next slide. A couple examples of the UL website. Enphase Energy, many of folks have heard of them with the uh, microinverters, and they make a microinverter battery system, uh, just like they do for PV modules. So it's a battery module. Let's go to the next slide. So just to give you a feel for that, and uh, the 2018 IRC, which many states are beginning to implement right now, um, our uh, say, state that energy storage systems must be installed in non-habitable spaces such as utility rooms, garages, storage rooms, or outside. So the much, most common installation locations for an energy storage system um, for residential would be attached garages, probably be number one, outside wall near the garage or service entrance, uh, like on the outside wall of a garage, a basement up in the northeast where it's really cold and where we've seen a lot of installations going in, basements are common, and utility rooms as well. So let's go to the next slide. So these simple requirements in the 2018 are reasonable for now, and I think they're working well because between the requirement for UL 9540 and the requirement um, for uh, installing in non-habitable spaces, which are the typical spaces we put them in, um, or outside. But if jurisdictions are looking for more specific language, there was quite a bit of work uh, based on uh, the NFPA 855 that went into the 2021 IRC. And I was definitely involved in the development of the wording for the 2021 IRC, uh, which is far more detailed. So if you wanted to get more detail than those basic requirements of the 2018 IRC, just to pro provide extra guidelines, uh, jurisdictions, uh, it's within their jurisdictional right to apply those things, but um, I would want to see people doing things more elaborately than what's in the 2021 IRC. And, and it's getting ready to be published. Um, it has not been posted yet, unless it's been posted in the last few days. Uh, but uh, it, probably in the next month, uh, we're going to see the 2021 posted on the internet, and you can you can view these uh, standards and codes, uh, um, the IRC, uh, free of charge, uh, so that you can view it online. So let's go to the next slide. We're just going to run through quickly what the 2021 IRC has in it. Um, what it does, it says that, uh, first of all, it says that an energy storage unit uh, should be no larger than 20 kilowatt hours, and each one of the units would have to be separated by three feet unless they were they had documentation based on large-scale fire testing, as we pointed out for Tesla, which Tesla has done, that would allow them to put these energy storage units closer than three feet apart. And so there's the basic rule of three feet apart and then closer if they've done this large-scale fire testing to prove that Basically, the fire doesn't track from one unit to the next and just keep the chain reaction going, which everyone's concerned about. Let's go to the next slide. So, it, so the locations gets a little more specific on locations. Talks about detached garages or detached accessory structures. 
uh, talks about attached garages, which is going to be a very common place, as we point, pointed out. Now, those de attached garages are going to be separated by a uh, con construction that follows section R302.6, which is the, the amount of sheetrock and things like that. And then the outdoors um, on the exterior side of exterior walls located a minimum of three feet from doors and windows that directly enter the dwelling unit. Really important to understand that if the door is going into a garage or the garage door itself, that does, there's no stipulation on distance there. But if the door is going directly into the house or you're putting it on the outside of the house next to a bedroom window, for instance, or a living room window, then it has to stay three feet away from that. And there is the concern that if, if for some crazy reason it were to catch on fire, that that fire would easily progress into a door or window that would catch the interior of the house on fire. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, the last item is that can be put in closed utility closets, basements, storage, utility spaces within dwelling units with finished or non-combustible walls or ceilings. So we saw a lot of non-combustible walls or ceilings, uh, like concrete block walls and stuff like that. And it basically says that if you've got a finished space or you have a non-combustible space, you're good to go. However, if you have um, unfinished wood frame construction, exposed wood frame construction, then that's going to need to see uh, 5 8 type X gypsum installed on it. And so as a retrofit, uh, if you're putting it in, say, a uh, unfinished uh, basement area where there's uh, no stud, no, no protection of the stud, or maybe it's got a block wall and an unprotected ceiling, then the ceiling would need to get this uh, type X sheetrock on it. Can't be installed in sleeping rooms or closets open directly into sleeping rooms, so you can't put it in, in your uh, walk-in closet in your master bedroom. Next slide. Energy ratings. <clears throat> um, we're looking at, again, a maximum of 20 kilowatt hours per unit. Uh, we're allowed to put up to 40 kilowatt hours within utility closets, basements, and uh, storage or utility spaces. That would be inside of a home. And then everything else is going to be out outside of the live of the uh, habitable spaces, which would be include attached garages and detached garages up to 80 kilowatt hours. That's a lot of energy storage. Um, and then up to 80 kilowatt hours on exterior walls. And we saw the stipulations on the exterior walls and then uh, 80 kilowatt hours out on the ground. If you wanted to go beyond that, then large scale, then you're going to and it sends you to the fire code. So it's follow section. 1206.1 through 1206.9. Again, this is the 2021 IRC. Nobody has adopted this yet. Uh, the state of California will be adopting it um, a year from this summer. So in about 13 months, we're going to adopt it, adopt these new rules. Let's go to the next slide. One of the more controversial items is fire detection. And so um, there are no specific requirements in the 2018 code for fire detection. However, in the 2021 code uh, requires that if you're going to put it inside the building, that it there be interconnected fire smoke alarms um, be connected with this. If we're in an area where a smoke alarm is not allowed to be used according to its listing, like a like an attached garage area, then that area uh, would need to have a heat detector. And so there's some stipulations on these heat detectors and how they would be interconnected and things like that. And so, um, but a heat detector would be something that would enunciate if something bad happened in the garage, for instance. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, protection from impact. This is in the 2018 code as well. Um, however, um, what we're saying is that if a vehicle could run into the unit, particularly on a back wall of a garage, then it would, there would need to be something like a parking block or something like that to prevent that from happening. However, the vast majority of these systems that I've seen are put on sidewalls. They're very narrow and would not need any vehicle protection in the inside of a garage if they're on a sidewall. Um, ventilation is, requ is a requirement only for equipment that needs ventilation during normal operation. And the only products that need ventilation during normal operation, flooded lead acid batteries, we're not going to see those in residences at all. And they'll never pass UL 9540. So, the UL9540 systems don't require any ventilation. Let's go to the next slide. All right, uh, Article 706, I mentioned it's in the electrical code, high level stuff, there's a requirement for disconnect, 
of the energy storage system. So there can be energy storage system disconnect, not a big deal there. Let's go to the next slide. Um, that slide is part of an NFPA um, training for firefighters. Uh, in dwelling units, a lot, of, a lot of jurisdictions get confused about this. It says in dwelling units, ESS shall not exceed 100 volts between conductors or ground. Well, the ESS we're using, um, a lot of these systems are 400 volts, and you go, oh my gosh, that's, an, that's a violation of the code. And no, no, it isn't. Uh, there's an exception. It says where live parts are not accessible during routine maintenance, an ESS voltage exceeding 100 volts shall be permitted. And the, the point to take away here is EO9540 precludes any exposed live parts, so there's no limitation on voltage within the ESS in the NEC. All those limits are in 9540. We're not going to see a 9540 battery for a residence over, let's say, 500 volts. That's just not going to happen because there's no practical reason to go higher than 500 volts. But all that's in, inside of a listed package. All right, I'm la wrapping up here. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, just a kind of summary, um, an electrical permit should really be the only necessary permit unless building modifications are necessary. So if somebody wants to put in an ESS, that's going to be an electrical permit in most jurisdictions. Typical building modifications that might require a building permit would be the installation of the Type X gypsum uh, to finish an unfinished space, installation of parking protection. If the SS is mounted on the back wall of a garage, it can be reached by cars. And number three would be the installation of heat detectors in garage or smoke alarms in the house. And so those would be things that you might need to have a, a, a building permit or those might be adjuncts to an electrical permit as an add-on, depending on how you handle those things. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Deborah at um, CAD. Um, thanks, Bill. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yep. we can hear you, Deborah. Excellent. Um, so I'm gonna be very brief. Um, we just want to close uh, today's webinar talking a little bit about how you might get started in your own community. Um, again, as, as Nadav mentioned and, and Bill reiterated, um, storage is, is pretty nascent. And for many um, communities, this is a pretty new area. Um, best practices are very much still under development and, and guidance, case studies, and other resources um, are, are being developed now. Um, but you know, a lot of those things don't, don't quite yet exist. Um, so, Wanted to just share maybe three ways um, that a community might get started if there's an interest in storage. Um, first, want to talk about training. Um, so if your community is, is interested and, and again sees that, that storage is coming, um, thinking about audiences that may need training within your community. Um, that could be building owners and, and uh, the owners of storage, or excuse me, of solar systems. Um, it might be town officials if you're interested in, in figuring out what your community could do to support storage. And, and lastly, you know, people like building inspectors and fire departments who may ultimately be involved in those permitting processes. So I think thinking about what training would be appropriate, um, this is an area where, where the Soul Smart team can be of assistance. Um, I think training can be a really great way to get started. Uh, the next slide. Um, I'm going to talk uh, again about that resource that was uh, mentioned by Nadav uh, for Boulder. Um, this is something I actually helped uh, work on a few years ago through a different DOE program, uh, Solar Market Pathways. Um, it was inspired by some work actually done in New York City to develop a permitting guide, but, um, but Boulder wanted to bring it down to a, an appropriate scale for them. Um, they had found that their storage permitting process was just very unclear, and uh, a number of folks who were interested in pursuing storage had maybe even decided not to because they weren't clear on the process and, and weren't sure that they would be able to get a permit. And so Boulder decided really just to create some transparency and clarity about their process. They actually didn't change anything. They simply gathered up the information and put it in one place and made it uh, easier to understand and easier to navigate. So the next slide just gives you a sense of what's in there. Um, they were able to, again, just define the steps in their process, help people see how the different pieces fit together, and therefore I think really create some transparency for folks that might be pursuing a storage um, project. So they didn't end up actually changing their process. Um, maybe they will do that in the future, but at least by creating the guide, they were able to, um, to help people see the, the steps that were involved and have realistic expectations about what they would need to produce and at what step in the process. Um, and then the last slide here, um, we just wanted to, to show and, and link you to some examples of permitting processes. Again, because this is very new, um, 
there's not necessarily one model that we would point to or say that anyone has figured it out. Um, but there are a number of examples and there are a number of communities that have created things like checklists, um, inspection guides, um, and so wanted to just link you to a few different examples. Again, for those of you who are getting started, often a nice place to start is to see what others have, have done and have developed and, and to go from there. So I think with that, um, we are turning it over to, uh, to Q&A. This is uh, Danny again. Uh, thank you to uh, Deborah and Adab and Bill, a very informative webinar. So uh, this section, I'm going to uh, turn it over to one of my colleagues with the Solar Foundation, uh, Toya, who will help us coordinate the Q&A section. Um, we're running a little bit late right now, later than uh, we were hoping. We were hoping to have about 10 minutes, but maybe some of our panelists might be able to stay on um, and answer any questions that happen to come up. Um, I don't know exactly what their schedules are looking like, so no problems that everyone can be there. But if you have any questions for any of our panelists here about anything that was mentioned in today's webinar, um, this is going to be online um, on our YouTube page, Go So Smart. Um, in the future, so you can always go back and take a second look. And also, we have email addresses here for if you have any questions for any of the individuals that were on the call or on this webinar. Um, feel free to get in touch with them or pick their brains if, if you happen to think of a question after this. But um, feel free, we're going to give everyone a minute to um, send in any questions they have for any of our panelists and. Uh, after that point, Toya will take over and uh, read some of the questions off uh, that some of the individuals on the call had for our panelists. Great, thanks, Danny. We'll just give folks about a minute to send in any questions you have. Um, if you don't have any questions, that's totally fine. Um, and if you happen to think of something later on, you can reach out to any of the, the panelists, as well as uh, Danny Falk at TSF. Toya, this is Bill. Is, is um, as far as where people can get this presentation, since there's lots of nice resources shown in several of these uh, slides, where where would they get that? Absolutely. If you go onto the SoulSmart website and uh, click on the resources tab, we will be um, uh, showing the the presentation, and there will also be a link to the SoulSmart um, YouTube channel where you can watch the uh, recording of this webinar. All right, so it doesn't look like we've got any questions coming in. Again, if you do have later on, please feel free to reach out to the panelists. Uh, Danny, I'll hand it over back to you. Great, thanks, Toya. Um, well, we appreciate everyone taking time out of your schedule to listen to our great panelists. And I'd like to thank uh, our three panelists and Toya as well for helping with uh, with the Q&A section. Um, and them taking time out of their day and thanking everyone who attended for taking time out of their day. Um, we know it's uh, tough times right now, but we appreciate you uh, taking that time out of your day to listen to us and learn a little bit more about uh, solar and storage. Uh, so with that, I think we'll sign off and uh, thank you again for everyone coming and for the panelists and uh, hope you have a great day and uh, you stay safe in a tough time. Thanks, Danny. Take care. Thanks all. Bye-bye.